Hi, my name is Isman and um, welcome to uh, this video lecture on spatial reference systems or coordinate reference systems. There's no real um, agreement on what to call them. You'll find both spatial reference systems and coordinate reference systems used. But well, basically, independent of what they are called, what they are about is creating a non-ambiguous way of referencing locations on the surface of the earth. And this basically is the key to using geodata because if we were not able to non-ambiguously reference a location, it was not much fun with geodata or it would at least be very limited. If we look at here, we have an aerial photography of, um, of the campus, the university campus, where we see the buildings and the lakes and so on. But I have also got a layer of object data describing the buildings. And if I activate that layer, we will see that luckily the object bill of the building, the vector data of the buildings, locates itself exactly where the buildings are on the aerial photography. And this is because there is some mechanism in both data sets that ensure that they non-ambiguously reference to locations on the surface of the earth. If we um, look at what this basically means or what we need in order to do this, we first of all need some form of knowing what is the shape and the size of the earth, the thing that we are referencing. Um, who first said that the earth is round, or to be precise, spherical, is lost in history. But at least already the ancient Greek Aristophanes, so about two, approximately 200 foot before Christ, was able to, disturb, to determine the circumflex of the earth as being 250,000 stages. If you want to know how he did it, there is a link to a little uh, video underneath here, um, which is IBM's video of how it was done. It's quite fun, uh, watch it. But anyway, he was a, he decided he could calculate it that it was that the circumference of the Earth was 250,000 stages. He then just added 2,000 stages so that the number was dividable by 360 so that his official value for the circumference of the Earth was 252,000 stages. 252,000 st stages is uh, 39,600 and 90 kilometers or um, 46,620 kilometers depending on on what was a stage it's some um, there are two alternative measures so that can't be known exactly but anyway that circumference is very close to what is the circumference in the polar Radius. So if you follow from pole to pole, then the circumference as we measure it today is 40,700 um, kilometers. So, already 200 years before Christ, there was a relatively good knowledge of what is the circumference of the Earth. This idea of the earth being spherical held until the late 17th century, early 18th century. And no, there is no historical proof for that. It was common to understand or see the world as flat as some know from stories about Columbus. That is fiction. All learned people in the period, period have had a knowledge of the earth as being round. 
in uh, 1687, Isaac Newton, in his uh, Principia theorized uh, that the Earth was a oblate ellipsoid. He did this based on um, his newly discovered theory of gravity. Um, a oblate ellipsoid is basically just a flattened spheroid. Um, and we express the degree of flattenedness as a minus b divided by a, where a is the semi-major axis of the ellipsoid and b is the semi-minor axis. These are often very very small numbers so it's common to give the reciproc value. So what Newton did when he got the idea of the ellipsoid, the oblique, oblique ellipsoid was quite right but he calculated the flattening as 1 to 235. Today we will say that the reciproc value of um, the flattening is 1 to 298.25 and a lot of other digits. Um, it's just something that's no while precise. So he didn't get that the flattening right, which is primarily to do with that although he had this theory of the gravity, he did not know that the mass of the Earth is unevenly distributed. And that does really change the calculation quite a lot. Um, in uh, 1791, the period of the French Revolution, everything had to be based on science instead of God. A meter was defined as being one millionth of the distance from the equator to the pole or a quarter of the circumference of the Earth thus defining the circumference of the Earth to be 40,000 kilometers. This whole view of the elliptic world Earth was in was the understanding until um, 1828 where the known mathematic Gauss introduced a new concept, namely the sphere, the geroid. Um, the word geroid is a bit of nah. Um, basically geo, earth, oid, shape, so a geroid is the earth shape. Um, the geroid is defined as what you might say a uh, theoretical global mean sea level. What do I mean by that? Well, if we Move the, remove the effect of the wind, the sun, the moon, all of these things that change, make tides and streams. So we have a sea level that is only affected by the rotation of the earth and the gravity of the earth. That sea level, that is what we might call um, the geroid. In wind land, if we have the same, if we dug very 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 small channels and uh, frictionless channels so that the water could run freely through these channels without using any of the water in the oceans then again that would be the geroid on the land so we could also a bit more scientifically say that it is a equipotential surface of the earth's gravity field so where the surface where we have a constant gravity pull from the Earth. And you might not know this, but you do not weigh the same different places in the, on the Earth. There is a difference scientifically between mass and weight. Your mass is the same, but your weight will change because your weight is defined by how the gravity pull between you and the Earth and some places the earth does not pull so much because there is not so much mass between you and the center of the earth. Might be because of different um, of the 
uh, tectonic plates moving, might be because of the existence of mountain ranges and so on. So the mass at different places is not the constant, it's not constant, and therefore the geroid is not a nice perfect shape. It's a very, very wobbly shape. Um, and it's defined by what we might call gravitational models. Um, the gravitational model that is used for most, as a basis for most geodata, is uh, EGM 9060 Earth gravitational model, um, which is a relatively precise model of it. Today we have the EGM 2008, which is an even more precise mathematical model of this gravitational um, um, surface. But basically there is this model and if you look um, at this picture here what this shows is the difference between a ellipsoid in this case it's the ellipsoid named VGS World Geodetic System which is um, probably the most used ellipsoid today so it's the difference between that, the definition, the shape of the Earth as defined in the VGS ellipsoid and the shape of the Earth as it's defined in the EGM 9060. And we can see that some places we have that the geroid is up to 80 meters above the ellipsoid and other places, so south of uh, India, we have that the geroid is 100 meters under the ellipsoid. So that is the differences between the ellipsoid and, um, and the geroid. Once we uh, have decided on the shape and the size of the earth, the next thing we need to do is find a way of referencing locations. Our good old friend Eratosthenes also already did that when in his first map of the earth here seen in the uh, replication for replica from uh, 1900 um, introduced the use of parallel lines to create a reference grid of what we might call latitude and longitude so we have on this map the parallel parallel is something that is parallel to equator of rotors and we have then also along our x-axis we have different meridians. Today we use more or less the same system um, but don't use quite as fancy names as the parallel of rotors but we operate with numbers from 0 to 360 so we have latitudes and longitudes where our latitude is the angle between the equator plane and the plane through the center of the earth and our location so that angle going north or south, that is our latitude, while our longitude is the angle between the plane going through um, Greenwich in London and the point we, applying, point that we are referencing to. So we have a longitude going from Greenwich zero and then going eastwards up to 180 so we have 180 degrees and then we have the same going from London and going westwards from zero to 180 and our latitude going from equator to the north pole having values of zero to 90 degrees northing and from equator to the south pole going from zero to 90 degrees southing so, once all of this is place, in place, we can start looking at how to do it in um, using geodata in practice. First of all, using the geoid directly, that's far too complex for most uses. So, we normally use a ellipsoid that fits the geoid. So, the earth shape that is used in most geodata is called the it is based on a um, on a ellipsoid. 
there's basically two alternatives in uh, creating such an ellipsoid. We can make one that fits locally, so it has a perfect fit to the geoid within the area of Denmark, or we can make an ellipsoid that tries to fit perfectly to the whole of the globe as this VGS World Geodetic System uh, 84 that we saw before. So these are the two examples here. If you are working with a locally fitted geo ellipsoid, it does not have to have the center of the ellipsoid as the center of the earth. That can be somewhere else, as long as it is perfectly matching the geoid within the area that we are interested in. Examples of this could be uh, the North, these North New, uh, American datums. Most states in America use a specific datum within that state. And we have had uh, systems in Denmark that operate on the same. Global ones, as I mentioned earlier, the VGS 84 is probably the most uh, commonly used ellipsoid. On this figure we see um, the word datum. We'll come back to that um, in a moment. But let's st stay with, um, just see it as being an ellipsoid for now. Historically, we um, most countries started to use a single ellipsoid to describe the, the location. Um, it turned out with World War II and the many battles crossing boundaries between countries that there might be some use of having a international one and uh, come satellite and globalizations the need for having a global one such as a VGS has uh, been increased. If you look at this word that I have been trying not to define datum, um, what it really is, is is if we try we want to bind a coordinate system to the surface of the earth. We in addition to the ellipsoid also need at least one location of a known coordinate, but for instance the coordinate of uh, in Denmark we've used Eierbaun or there's been um, used coordinates for locations in Potsdam for European co um, reference systems. These have, they basically have to be somewhere which is in the center of the area that you're trying to map and that you want have given a defined coordinate of it. And thirdly we need to know the direction of the axis in our coordinate system. So typically it is we have a axis going north-south and an axis going east-west. So these three things, the ellipsoid defining the shape of the earth at, at least one point with a known coordinate and a definition of the direction of the axis that collectively is what we call a datum. So when we talk about datums, it's these three components that operate uh, we're talking about. Um, as I mentioned, most countries have had their own datums and new datums have been introduced as history needed them. Um, but what is the consequence of using a wrong datum? Because that can happen, although most data should have information together with it about what datum it is, it can happen that you get data that does not. Or you might be using a software that cannot operate with different types of datum at the same time. So if you look at an example, say this is taken from a American textbook, probably from a university near Texas, um, where we can define VGS as being the correct datum but if you've got the same data using an R datum, as for instance the European datum of 1950, we can see that our coordinates will be off by approximately 250 meters. Um, I'm using this example because that in Denmark, we until year 2000 used this European datum 1950, and today we use 
the datum which is very similar to the VGS. So if you're using historical data, for, um, or at least data from before year 2000, there is a good chance that it will be in the European datum 1950. And if this information is lacking, or if the software that you're using is not able to operate with two different datums, you'll have that the one data set will be offset from the other one by 250 meters. So be aware of that type of errors because it will probably be because that you have a problem related to the datum used. Okay, until now I've been talking about what is called geographic coordinate systems. So this latitude and longitude. They are good for referencing location on the earth. However, often we work with geodata as something on a map, something that is flat. And we want to do things like easily do calculations of distances by using Pythagoras. And that can't be done with latitudes and longitudes. Latitudes and longitudes are perfect for storing data over large areas, whole globe, continent. They are good for navigational purposes, but for doing mappings of towns or small areas such as Denmark, oh, they are not the optimal. So there we often use what is called a projected coordinate system. A coordinate system that does not directly reference to the surface of the geoid, earth, but to a map, which then of course again references to the geoid. So we're talking about what is called projected coordinate systems. Projections is a very big issue in geodata and in the lectures about map design we'll be talking much more about for different types of projections and what they can do. But to start out with, we'll just talk about the projections that we use to create coordinate systems, cards and coordinate systems in Denmark. The projection, just to shortly mention what this, it basically it, it, it borrows the concept from a light projection. So we can have a light source and this light source shines onto a transparent globe and then displays the shape of the land masses or whatever onto a projected surface. So this concept can be used in order to understand what a projection is. Most projections then they have the light bulb in the center of the earth and do strange things but we'll talk about that later when we talk about projections in uh, the map the design part. For using Danish local coordinates, we use a projection which is called a universal transversal mercator. So a mercator means that it is a cylinder, so we are projecting onto a cylinder. Transverse means that the cylinder is in a east-west and not a north-south axis, so it's not in the polar, it's on a right angle to the polar axis of the Earth. And universal is because it tries to solve um, the problem of making a precise projection to win anywhere on the Earth. And it does this by splitting the Earth into zones. We have 60 zones covering the whole of the Earth. Each of these zones will then be 6 degrees wide. So we have these zones that a six degrees wide. This is a map of um, the UCM zones. Um, if you look close at Denmark you can see that Denmark falls into two zones namely the 32 and the 33 zone. Typically we ignore this and then just use the 32 zone for Danish data. But if you are using a GPS it will automatically switch between these two zones and the border between zone 32 and, 33 and zone 33 is just west of the university at uh, 
the town of Svoboslo. So if you go west of Svoboslo, you will be in zone 32. If you go east of Svoboslo, you will be in zone 33. These um, um, destinations, these numbers going uh, south, uh, north, south are not normally used in Danish mapping situations. So we will ignore them for now. The problem with using project data is that although they give us XY coordinates that are in the Cartesian system, so in this case we have um, in zone 32 we have our Y axis given as meters north of equator and our X axis given as meters north of a fictive line somewhere in the North Sea. There are arrows in them and that is the thing about projections there will always be some form of error introduced by not operating on the geroid. The size of this error, you just have to understand what is it and does it matter, is that if we look on distance measurements, we can see that if you're working with zone 32, we have, if we are measuring distances in Jutland, on the map, we will be off by 40 centimeters for each kilometer we measure. And that's, for most geographical purposes, not really so important. We can live with that, as long as we're not doing designing roads and things like that. We, it's okay to have an error or distortion of 40 centimeters per one in kilometers as the maximum. There will also be distortion to what's north, um, but typically that's um, a problem in the island of Bonhol, and so we'll just ignore that for the moment. But it is, um, the UTM is a projected data set, that means that it is not, there will be this type of distortions, never mind what we do. But they are, because it's a projection of a limited area, we live with them. Working uh, with corner system Denmark, the one that you might typically come across is UTM data. So this universal transversal locator, so 32 or 33, based on the datum of European datum 1950 or 8050. So this was this datum that was introduced after the Second World War as a common European datum. So an ellipsoid, a reference point, the reference point for the ED European datum 1950 is Potsdam. Um, or was Posto. Um, it uh, as the Cold War grew in intensity, um, it was moved away from Potsdam because Potsdam was on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain in the wish. But originally, it was Potsdam that was the reference point of the European datum 1950. So that's you'll find that datum uh, as a base for um, maps before year 2000, and. Some organizations have been a bit slow to adapt, so also some maps after the year 2000, but there shouldn't be. Um, I understand here I've written that it will include a vertical datum of uh, DNN. What that means, I'll come back to in a moment. But that is some of uh, our data. So typically, maps before year 2000, there will be UTM, so for two, so for three and in using the datum of the European datum 1950. Maps produced after year 2000 should be in, again UTM, using the datum ETRS 89, European Terrestrial Reference System, which is a common European uh, datum, just like the EDR 50. It's an EU uh, project. Um, there's been some problems um, which hopefully you will not encounter but in a period there was a period where Denmark and the other Nordic countries were some of the first to adopt to this and for reasons unclear to me they were it was not called ETIS but Euroref um, so if you come across this term Euroref um, 
it might be a mistake. It should be European Terrestrial Reference System. Uh, Euroref is now used for something completely different and that can give some problems, but hopefully not. Um, these maps, they use an article data to talk about what it is in a moment, that is called DVR90. Eurorif. Um, I've mentioned that the VGS is probably the most commonly used uh, ellipsoid and uh, EGIS is more or less the same as the VGS. The only difference is that VGS is a global system so it is fixed into the star system if it's, it's universal and the problem being that cities they move because cities are on continental plates and continental plates they drift um, Europe is moving approximately two three centimeters a year in a northeasterly direction our continent such as Australia are moving by seven centimeters a year and to and that would mean that the coordinate of Copenhagen is constantly changing. So we will have to say, okay, this was the coordinate of the co of Copenhagen or the Oscar University, the location in uh, the lecture room. That's m as it was registered in, and then say, 1990. If we measure the same thing, location, ten years later it will be off by approximately 25 centimeters and 20 years later 50 centimeters so to avoid this what has introduced this ETIS European Terrestrial Reference System which is a system that is locked onto the continental plate of Europe so in this image in the, in the, on the slide we have um, a series of dots which are GPS registration, um, GPS stations that very precisely monitor their location in the VGS system and then translates it to the ETIS. Of course, this is only again if you are into detailed mapping. For most city mappings, we don't really care about errors of the size of 25 centimeters, we can live with it as long as they are constant throughout our map. So for most practical users the EGIS 89 and the VGS 84 are more or less the same or can be conceived to be the same but the VGS is a global system so the coordinates of towns and so on they will change through time while the EGIS is a reference system that is locked into the European continental plate and follows it. So all locations on the continental plate they will stay have the same coordinate through time. Then we have this thing about this vertical datum. Um, earlier we said that well using the geoid is too complex. Well, it's too complex for locations in X and Y, but for said values, it is something we need to consider because, in the case of Denmark, the ellipsoid, the VGS or the ETIS ellipsoid, is somewhere between 36 and 40 meters below sea level. And if we use that for our said value, then we'll have a shoreline being around. 30 meters above sea level, which is a bit counterintuitive. And this consideration, but note by the way that many GPSs, if they do not have a altimeter in them, so something based on air pressure to make, measure the elevation, they but they use the GPS signal to decide on the elevation. They'll probably be referencing to the ellipsoid. So if your GPS says that the elevation at the sea level is 30 meters above sea level, well that's probably what's going on. This of course is not very practical if you're working with 3D data 
and 3D data is becoming more and more used. So therefore, we, uh, we have this concept of a vertical datum, a datum which is only used for giving the set data. So we have one datum for the X and Y, typically VGS, and then we have another datum for the set data. So defining what is the C level. In Denmark, together with uh, the horizontal datum of the ETIS, sorry, of the European datum 950, we used a vertical datum, Danish normal null DNN, which was our was C level in the period of around 1980. Um, when we changed to the horizontal datum of ETIS, we also changed our vertical datum because change the seal the sea level of Denmark is changing up primarily so much because of global warming but because that the land masses are rebounding after the glacial period so the land masses are rising a bit so we, we need to uh, introduce a new um, sea level which is this called DVR uh, 90 and if you're going to work with set data, be aware that there can be up to 13 centimeters in difference between the DNN and the DVR. So, if you are set value, working with set values, so measuring elevation or uh, soil profile, that's one of the situations where it comes into, into play. Many uh, soil profile registers, registrations are old from before year 2000 and they will be using the vertical datum of DNN and if you then go out and do new measurements or compare it with new data you will have data using the vertical datum of DVR90 and they do not necessarily have to fit together so beware of that when you are working with geographic coordinates so, this lecture has been about geographic coordinates in, in, in general. So we've talked about the, what, the ones that we call geographic coordinates. So that's latitude and longitude. And we talk about projected coordinate systems. And in Denmark, we operate typically using the projection system called UTM, Universal Transversal Mercator. In Denmark is in the zones of 32 and 33 so that's how what uh, you will find them as old Danish data where you will find that they use a ellipsoid or a datum to be in the correct term of European datum of 1950 new Danish data will be using another datum namely the datum ETIS European Terrestrial Reference System and if you by accident mix them and the software is not aware of what's going on or the data the information about the datum is missing from the data then you will be probably see that you'll be have an offset of about 250 meters in the north eastern direction so if you have that type of problem that's probably the reason is probably that you're having a problem with different datums in the next lecture I'll be talking about the more practical part. We'll start on using the software and see how all of this works in the software content. So until then, see you. Bye.